Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about momentum and impulse. We are uh, taking Newton's second law a step further, seeing what that really told us, and looking at these two ideas of impulse and momentum. This is topic 2.4 in your data booklet. So let's go back to Newton's second law, where he talked about the alteration of motion. Motion uh, was further defined the quantity of motion is the measure of the same, arising from the velocity and quantity of matter conjunctly. So again, this is a little old-timey, but we can break down what it means. Velocity is easy enough. And quantity of matter, I think we can agree, probably means mass. So motion, this quantity of motion, which we're going to call momentum, comes from velocity and mass conjunctly which is a fancy way of saying multiplied together. So motion, which the quantity of motion, which we, we now call momentum, is a product of velocity and mass. It's those two things combined together. And the definition of momentum is this mathematical definition. Momentum is of an object is the product of the object's mass and velocity. Uh, this would make momentum a vector. Of course, the IB uh, cruelly does not put any vector bars on anything in the data booklet because they want you to understand what is and what isn't a vector. So you need to remember which things are vectors, which things aren't. Velocity is a vector. Mass is a scalar. It turns out when you multiply a scalar by a vector, you get a different sized vector. So momentum is a vector, as is velocity, which means momentum has direction. Okay, Newton's second law, when we really break down what those words mean, is that the net force acting on a body is equal to the rate of change of momentum of the object. If we look back at this law, proportional to the mode of force impressed and the alteration of motion is what we're talking about here, the change in momentum. So really, he mathematically constructed this second law like this. Net force equals rate of change of momentum. You'll notice this is a gradient. This is how momentum changes with time. So the net force acting on an object is equal to the object's change of momentum divided by delta t. We can call the duration is something we'll use a lot if we're talking about a collision. Uh, the time that the net force we care about acts. Uh, notice in the data booklet version, they don't really give you any kind of sigma or indicate that this is a net force. But of course, F here has to be the net force. So you need to remember that when you look at this equation. It's not just one force. Uh, but the net force acting on an object tells me about its rate of change of momentum. So when, when they ask you to define Newton's second law, this is what you want to do. You can do it with an equation as long as you define everything or just make this statement. And you have to be specific. It's not equal to the change of momentum. It's equal to the rate of change of momentum. So net force equals delta P over delta T. That is Newton's second law right there. We can look at something interesting that happens. If the mass is fixed, if the mass is constant and unchanging, like in 99% of the problems you're going to deal with in IB physics. Exceptions might be something like a rocket ship, which is constantly losing mass as it burns up fuel. Um, but if the mass of a system doesn't change and the mass of the object doesn't change, then we can do the change in momentum. Uh, my final momentum would be just the mass times the final velocity. Since momentum is mv, my initial momentum would be mass times the initial velocity. In other words, I could factor out the m. Notice I have final minus initial velocity over here. That's a change in velocity. So if we look at this, I see I end up with this constant mass times the rate of change of velocity, which of course is acceleration. So this is why F equals MA is pretty much more or less Newton's second law whenever the mass doesn't change, which is very rarely in the problems we're going to be dealing with in, in IB physics. But it's not exactly right to say that that is Newton's second law because you can have a changing mass system with like a delta m delta t. They love problems where you have a child sitting on a on a um, on some kind of wheelbarrow throwing uh, throwing rocks out the back, and 
uh, that causes the thing to move forward, some crazy stuff like that. And you have, you're throwing three kilograms of rocks every second or something. But for the most part, we're going to be dealing with uh, the constant mass system when we do these. All right, let's talk about one other term called impulse. And impulse is a change in momentum. This is a little bit of a weird one. This is really the only variable, at least that I can think of, where it's a variable defined as a change in another quantity. So the quantity of impulse is the change of momentum. So impulse is literally the final momentum minus the initial momentum over some period of time. We call that impulse. So it's going to have the same units as momentum, everything like that. If we want, then we can rearrange Newton's second law to see what the impulse is, and the impulse is equal to force times delta t. This also appears in your data booklet. Notice they just write out the word impulse, right? There is, you will see some places use j, the variable, for impulse. The IB doesn't do that. Uh, they just write the word impulse. They'll usually just use it as a word in a problem. But so impulse measures a change in momentum, and Importantly, we see there's two factors that go into it, the net force and the amount of time that that net force acts. So if a force acts for a long time, it will cause a big change in momentum. Uh, no big surprise. If a big force acts for a certain amount of time, that causes a big change in momentum. So those two things you can imagine together cause a change in momentum. This is even one more way we can think about a force now. We said in the forces unit that a force causes acceleration. In the energy unit, we said force is the, the way that we do work. And now you can see force causes a change in momentum. So there's a lot of ways we can combine all these things and move between these different units. Uh, like everything in physics, everything plays together. And it's up to you to choose the most convenient and clever way to solve a problem because there's lots of paths open to you. All right. One other thing about that equation is when I have a uh, force and time, uh, F delta T, it turns out that that's another version of this area under the curve thing. Um, I need to have a constant force for that to work. If I don't, I want to use a force time graph and the area under a force time graph is equal to the impulse. This is important because in any collision, you don't really have a constant force. Even this, a nice triangle isn't usually what you get. You get something more like a curved, uh, almost a steep bell curve where in any collision during any impact, there's no force in the beginning because there's no contact. As the contact starts, that force ramps up to some peak value. And then as the contact comes to an end, the force decreases back to zero. So it would be difficult to just pick a force to use to multiply by a time and get that impulse. But here, uh, if I have a force time graph, the area under the curve is the impulse. So this is one that's similar to a force distance graph, where if you see that graph, you know that you take the area under the curve to get the work done. If you see a force time graph, you know that this graph is for finding impulse. The only thing you can really do with this graph is take the area under the curve and get the impulse. This maximum value we usually call peak force. OK, let's look at how we can use some of these problems, uh, impulse problems. I have an object falling from rest. We're going to ignore air resistance. And I want to find its velocity after about half a second. We know a lot of ways we could do this now with kinematics, even conservation of energy. We're going to try it with momentum. And we're going to try it by looking at the net force and setting that equal to the rate of change of momentum. Uh, here, I know since I'm falling from rest, I'm falling, it's in free fall, there's no air resistance, the net force is just the weight of the object, so I'm going to use mg for that. I also know uh, if I want to solve for the change in momentum, uh, I can just rearrange this upper equation here. And that change in momentum, uh, here I'll use my suvat variables as my final momentum minus my initial momentum, where in both cases, momentum is mass times velocity. So mass times final velocity, mass times initial velocity. I'm plugging in mg for my net force, delta t. 
Let's start from rest, so we're going to drop the uh, that term. Notice my masses cancel out, and I get my speed is g times delta t. You could solve this problem with kinematics. You could solve this problem with conservation of energy. You're going to find the same thing no matter what. But so this is how we could apply this uh, impulse and changing momentum and a definition of Newton's second law to solve a problem like this. Here's another one where we can deal with impulse, uh, where I have a tennis ball moving towards a brick wall with a certain speed. It rebounds backwards with a slightly smaller speed, and I have the time that I'm in contact for. I want to find the average force exerted by the wall on the ball. This is a very common momentum problem. The IB loves a rebound problem because there's one trick to it that is sneaky, and that is picturing what's happening here. I come in with an initial velocity to the right, and I rebound with the final velocity to the left. So I have to deal with that direction when I deal with my change in momentum. So here's what that would look like. I'm using Newton's second law here, and I know that the change in velocity is going to be final minus initial. What you need to be careful of is the final velocity is negative 33 meters per second because it's to the left. My initial velocity is positive 37 and I'm subtracting it. So I end up in, in a way their magnitudes add together. That's how these vectors work. If I had a, a vector that was 5 meters per second to the right and then I had another vector that was 3 meters per second to the left, the change in velocity is 8. You need to go all the way down to 0 and then go 3 more to the left. All right, so same thing over here. I have a very large change in velocity because I've changed direction. So be really careful with the signs there. It's really easy to look at this and just pick a change in velocity of 4, which would be the change in speed, but we got to take the direction into account. So I can find my net force easily using this as long as I'm careful with my signs. And there we go. Lastly, we can discuss the impact of these ideas on safety. A big thing that these are important for and something that the IB will love to have you talk about is what does this mean for designing safety equipment? Um, airbags are a common example. Uh, but here's an example of, uh, of a boxer uh, and the classic idea, if you've heard the phrase rolling with the punches, um, this is the idea is there's this relationship between uh, force and time in a collision. Right, force and time. Now, the IB uses delta T, um, but this is force times the duration. And for a given change in momentum, we can talk about these two variables. So, for example, the boxer's fist comes in with a certain speed, and we're going to decrease that speed down to zero with our face. Uh, so, the mass of the boxer's fist and the change in speed are fixed. The change in momentum is set. There's no way to affect the change in momentum for this collision. The only things that can change are the force and time. So we can see that there's an inverse relationship between force and time. So for example, if we solve for force. So we can't change the mass of the boxer's hand. We can't change the change in velocity. The only thing we can affect is the time. So you have two options. Uh, if a boxer is about to punch you in the face, uh, your two options would be to roll with the punch, which increases the time. If you, uh, you know, this, you can see the, the boxer here allowing himself to move backwards. And that increases the time of the collision with a greater time. That means there will be smaller net force. And that is a very good thing for your face. Whereas if you stand rigidly with your neck forward and don't allow your head to move, you decrease the time, which will increase the force. This quantity, the net force times the duration of the collision, is going to equal the change of momentum one way or another. So if you have a very t big time, a very long time, the force doesn't have to be so big. But if the time is short, you need a large force. Uh, pretty much all safety equipment is designed with this in mind. An airbag is designed with this in mind. If you're in a car crash, um, 
you know, if you're, let's say there's a car moving 30 miles an hour and then there's a, there's a crash and an accident, that car is going to go down to zero miles an hour. That change in momentum is fixed. There's a big hunk of metal moving with a certain mass, moving at a certain speed, and it's going to go down to zero. That change in momentum is fixed. And you, with your body, are moving 30 miles an hour. You have a certain mass, and you're going to decrease your momentum down to zero. It is very important that that change in momentum happens with a large time and not a large force. So what we do is we implement the airbag. And the airbag greatly increases the duration of the collision as compared to if you were to hit the dashboard or the steering wheel. That increase in time is vital in making sure that there are non-lethal forces in a collision. Uh, sports safety, this is very important there as well. The padding and helmets does the same thing. This is why uh, it's very important to wear a helmet because it will increase the duration of a collision decreasing the forces uh, in any kind of collision in a, in a sport setting. So that's the idea behind this relationship between force and duration, the force, the net force acting and the amount of time that it acts for. All that being said, you should have the tools now to start working on momentum problems and start seeing the fun applications of all of these ideas. So have fun.